All right, good evening. Good to see everybody. And welcome to the 11th event in the Climate Solutions Speaker Series. As, as Bernie said, we're a consortium of eight Concord organizations. We started this project back in 2013 because we share the conviction that climate change is the most dangerous and difficult challenge of the 21st century. The Pentagon calls climate change a threat multiplier. And our first speaker, Craig Altmos, back in 2013, helped explain what this means. He talked about the massive, unprecedented 2010 heat wave that swept through Europe and especially in Russia, devastated the Russian wheat harvest, and led to a halt in all Russian grain exports that year, which led to food riots and political instability in the Middle East, because they usually eat that Russian grain which led in part to the Arab Spring, which led in part to the disaster we see in Syria today. And now there is a wave of migration into Europe from the Middle East and Northern Africa, leading to the rise of anti-immigrant right-wing sentiment. This has caused massive political upheaval across Europe. And the instability has also reached the United States. This is what climate change can look like. It is indeed a threat multiplier. In the graphics folder on my hard drive, I have a collection of images that I go to frequently. It is called Washington, DC. And I always think of it as my images of our democracy. Vibrant pictures of the White House, the Congressional Dome, the stately pillars of the Supreme Court. But ever since the recent election, my mind kind of goes in a different direction. This is what democracy looks like. This, all of you, an informed and concerned citizenry, is what is going to get our democracy through the next four years. At a time when we re need to redouble our efforts to cut CO2 emissions, the new administration has appointed an EPA chief who spent his career suing that agency and who says he doesn't believe in CO that CO2 is a primary contributor to global warming. Budget cuts of up to one-third are planned, and they have already announced that they plan to sack the automobile fuel economy standards and abandon the clean power plant, which are actually the cornerstone of the US's commitment to the Paris Climate Accords. Tonight, Reverend Mariana White-Hammond will speak to us about opportunities in a time of crisis. I can't imagine a more timely topic, so thank you for being here. And we, the informed and engaged citizenry, will have the responsibility to make use of those opportunities, to say, no, this is not OK. And we're going to work hard to preserve our American democratic values, along with a stable climate, and to come together with renewed inspiration and resolve. Reverend Mariana White-Hammond is an ecological minister at the Bethel AME Church in Boston and a member of the Mass Interfaith Coalition for Climate Action. She is, an ordain she is ordained in the African Methodist Episcopal Church and is currently a candidate for a Master's in Divinity degree at Boston University School of Theology. Previously, she was the executive director of Project Hip Hop, a youth-led organization that engages young people in critical thinking, artistic production, and community organizing. For her work at Project Hip Hop, she received the 2004 Roxbury Founders Day Award, and together with the youth, the 2005 Boston Celtics Heroes Among Us Award. She's recently spoken at the Cambridge Forum and gave the 2016 Theodore Parker Lecture. And most recently, or more recently, she was a featured speaker at the Boston's Women March for America. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Mariama White-Hammond. So I'm, I'm very grateful to be here, and thank you for having me. Um, it's exciting to see um, people come together. I think that's something that we need a lot more um, in these times, and to um, have heard your story of groups that are saying, maybe we might be stronger doing it together rather than each doing it separately um, is a testament um, to the kind of citizen leadership that we need in this moment. 
So I assume that most of you are here because you care about climate. And um, we certainly have a climate crisis. <laughs> um, but I think that most of us are also clear that the crisis we face in this moment is actually even bigger than um, just climate change. And I like to say climate is a problem, but it is not the problem. I actually believe it is a symptom of a larger failing system that's in crisis. For years, the environmental movement has tried to talk about climate without acknowledging that the problem in our system is much bigger than parts per million of carbon. And this last election and the unfolding of the current administration did not create the crisis, but it is certainly a symptom of the crisis. And so I think that it is, uh, uh, makes sense in this year um, to reflect on the words of Dr. King, who in 1967, so more than um, 50 years ago, asked the question, where do we go from here, chaos or community? I think that that is a really appropriate question for us in this moment. So I want to talk about three crises that I have, I, I think we have, and why I think they are opportunities. The first is the opportunity of our shared angst. In this moment, I would say we are pretty united in a sense of crisis. So I've been an activist for years, and quite frankly, in communities of color, with the chronically unemployed and underemployed and immigrants communities, people have felt like we were in a bad place for quite a while. Um, I did a lot of work in um, communities in Boston where um, not only do people feel like there are fewer and fewer jobs, those jobs, even if you have one, don't allow you to pay the cost of rent in the city, and so you saw more and more people moving out to communities where there weren't jobs, sometimes without even the cars to help them get themselves back in. And so it was not surprising to me at all uh, last year when Boston was named as the most um, unequal city in America. Now, I don't know if that's 100% true. I think there's some other places that would rival us for it. But the, the growing um, disparity between the rich and the poor in our um, communities have been growing over um, really the past at least 10 years, although one could say um, that it really started before that. And so you had a lot of communities that have felt in crisis for a long time. And then a few years ago, we saw young people really recognize that crisis. I would say the Occupy movement really came out of young people who realized that for the first time they might be in an economic position that is worse than their parents. And so they said, wait a second, um, as Dr. King talks about the bad check that America has presented, I think a lot of young people realized that America had given them a bad check. And so those young people, I think, were one of the main reasons that we saw President Obama elected. Um, they showed up in record numbers um, and probably were, or not probably, most, I think most statisticians would say were the group that made a big difference in his election. But then in this last couple of years, we've seen that working class whites have realized that the American dream is not working for them either. Rural communities are feeling more and more under siege. I remember a conversation I had with a, a gentleman who clearly had voted for Trump, although he didn't exactly want to admit it to me um, <laughs> when he first met me, um, who talked about living in a community where he invested all of his life and just assumed that his children and his grandchildren would, would be there. He talked about how at Thanksgiving and Christmas, the town would swell as people's children came home for the holidays, but then they left. And, and most of the time they left because there just weren't jobs in the community anymore. And so a man who had expected to spend his retirement walking his grandchildren to school every day instead only got to see his family a couple of times of, of the year. And he felt like maybe, just maybe, if we could keep jobs in this community, maybe our kids would come home and all of the things I've invested in would come true. And so as working class whites 
and rural communities and conservative communities felt a sense of crisis, we saw the rise of President Trump and quite frankly the Tea Party and many other things um, as our country has become more conservative. And then after the election, we had a crisis among the sort of mostly liberal white community and communities of color, many communities that went into crisis after the election just didn't think it was possible that it was gonna happen. Um, you know, I, as a minister, I you know, got calls from a lot of uh, folks afterwards. Um, I had a sense before um, <laughs> that it was not looking good. Um, but the defeat of Hillary Clinton um, led many people to ask this question, what, what country do I actually live in? And so I would say at this point, with a few exceptions, Donald Trump probably and his friends, um, most of us feel like the country is in crisis in one form or another. Now, I won't say that we have a shared understanding of exactly what to do about that or what the central core issues are, but I do think we have a shared sense of angst. And so if we apply Dr. King's question of where do we go from here, chaos or community, I think we really have two options in this moment. The chaotic option is just to scapegoat to blame somebody else for the place that we're in. And this is not just an American problem. I just was in Germany recently while um, Europe is having the same rise. Um, we saw with Brexit and the vote in the Netherlands. This idea that all my problems are because somebody else um, is here and if we could just get rid of them, we could go back to the good times, we could make America great again. It was amazing, I was in the um, to, this museum called the Topography of Terror, it's about the rise of the Nazis. And um, you know, most of the tours were in German, which you know, I had learned a little bit of German on Duolingo, but not, certainly not enough to understand a German tour. And so there were a group of um, young people from the UK, and so they had an English tour, and I thought, well, you know, maybe I just cozy up to their tour so I could understand what's going on. And it was fascinating to hear um, the tour guide sort of said, you know, to German, he says, my grandparents voted for Hitler. Why do you think they did that? And a young man raised his hand and said, he promised to make Germany great again. It was a little overwhelming <laughs> to see that. Um, and the... The, the tour guide said, well, yeah, that was a part of it. Um, but he also talked about the huge, massive recession and um, the after World War II, World War I sense by Germans that their life, their livelihood, their sense of stability was eroding. And so we can have that chaos of scapegoating, nationalism, the rise in the belief that we can go back to some greater past, but we know where that takes us. We've been there before. So what is the option for community? I like to suggest that it's a, a kind of very deep dialogue that starts from the notion that we are in this together. And that's not a prescription for somebody else somewhere. That's a prescription, I think, for us right here, right now. As we face this shared angst, as we face this moment, I've been a little concerned because I've heard a lot of people talking about resistance in a way that is not about being in this together, not about a deep dialogue to figure out why are we so divided and what will it take for us to come together. And so our first opportunity is to lean into this shared angst by reaching across divisions of race, of class, of political affiliation, to ask ourselves the question, what would it really mean to be in this together? To face this angst, not by blaming each other, and it's not just you know, blaming immigrants, not just blaming Trump supporters, but really asking, can we create community out of this moment? I think our second opportunity is the crisis of leadership. We certainly have a crisis of leadership. <laughs> and I, I actually think, you know, I, 
Yes, okay, obviously I do not think that President Trump is a great leader. I'm not going to deny that. But I think that the crisis of leadership is actually much deeper than that. We have a system of government, governance that is far more interested in winning than in leading. There's a constant counting of seats and a general rancor that really makes it hard to get important things done. And we saw that today, right? You know, after how many years of being against Obamacare, folks finally looked up and realized they actually didn't have another solution, right? But I don't think it's just the Republicans that are in that position. I think many of us, far too many of us, define ourselves by what we are against and haven't asked ourselves the tough question, how would we work together for the things that we're actually for? I don't think it's just our electeds. I think it's a challenge that we all face. And I also think that we put far too much into getting people elected and far too little into making a system that brings people together to figure out the solutions to our common challenges. So we could choose the option of chaos and maintain all of the eggs in the basket of this current system and wait for the great leader that's going to save us all. But we've seen where that leads people. I would say that has something to do with the moment that we're in right now. Or we can choose the option of community. And that means creating these solutions ourselves, taking the dialogue that we've talked about across divisions of race, class, geography, and political affiliation, and then telling our elected leaders what we want them to do. I mean, what if, for once, Concord and Boston and Framingham and New Bedford showed up together saying, this is what we want you to do? Would we see the same dynamics at the State House if those people in Republican districts and those people in Democratic districts actually sat down together and went in and confronted their elected leaders together, asking them to take a different kind of leadership than what we're used to. This is an example of what you all are doing here, of leaning into the importance of everyday folks trying to come up with solutions together, rather than just waiting for the next great leader that we can all vote for, and then four years later ask them what they did for us. Our final crisis and opportunity is that which I think brings many of us here, which is that we are functioning a system that's on its way to collapse. We, we literally can't live this way anymore. For the first time, young people are, are recognizing that they will not do better than their parents. And we know that our way of life was built on stealing resources from our great-grandchildren. We can't keep living this way. Climate is sort of that bell that will eventually ring. It's ringing already. <laughs> it's ringing already. But we're still able to sustain it just a little bit. There will eventually come a point where it rings so loud it will drive us crazy. The chaotic option is the one we got already. Let's just keep this current system of addiction to the extraction economy and our exploitation of those who've been considered expendable. Let's just keep that way of living and let's just wait and see. And we know that we will eventually reach a point where there are more refugees than there are people in their native lands. Where whole places that we have become connected to and that we love, I think of my, my city, I live in Dorchester. And I love being able to run to Carson Beach. Remember last year after I got arrested in the West Roxbury Pipeline, my parents, my, my mother, it was my birthday, so my family was already going to be together and they picked me up from jail and I told them I really just wanted to go to Carson Beach. And my niece was skipping stones with my husband. Um, and I had a moment of sadness when I recognized that there may come a time where children are afraid of the beach because it will be the place from which the flooding comes. 
It was sad to imagine that Carson Beach might not be available for future generations because we'll have to put a seawall to protect ourselves from the ocean. We have a system in a collapse. And we could certainly just wait and see. I don't know if any of you, I love kind of apocalyptic television and, and um, books. I have a few that, um, that are my favorites. One being, um, I don't know, does anybody know Octavia Butler's work? She's an amazing, she calls herself a futurist, but she fits usually in the category what most people would call sci-fi. And she writes a book, um, Parable of the Sower, about a young woman named Lauren who's never seen rain. So we know what the chaotic option looks like, and we've spent plenty of time trying to get people to recognize that. But have we spent equal time imagining what the community option is? It's a world in which we begin reimagining how we will live with each other in what Dr. King called beloved community. It means new experimentations and new experiments in how we live and house ourselves, creating communities that capitalize on different skills and where we all don't have to have, you know, individualized items, right? But we share them collectively. It means creating spaces where our children have access to the different forms of wisdom that we thought were no longer important, like gardening and carpentry. And it means living not simply from re resistance, but with a strong spirit of active vision, where we stand up for what we believe in and make a new world rather than just reacting to and fighting what currently exists. The reality is that these crises are not just American crises, they're not just Massachusetts crises, these are global crises. And we could think about what the whole world should do and that is certainly appropriate and important. But I also wanna challenge you to think about what does it mean for this group here in Concord, mostly white, mostly upper middle class community, I think mostly liberal leaning. Uh, are you willing to work for mixed income eco villages right here in Concord? Are you willing to champion the notion that schools should have partnerships with senior facilities so that our children can both learn from and teach our elders? Are you willing for, to look for new forms of food distribution that reduces packaging and is more local, but also serves the need of working families and low-income disabled folks at the same time. We need to lean into solutions that hit multiple challenges at the same time. That's what it means to reimagine the world that we live in. People ask me all the time, well, what do you do? I mean, how can we even do this? There's so many climate deniers, and yes, this is, there are climate deniers out there. There's, as Naomi Klein would say, there's the obvious climate deniers who will just tell you that they're climate deniers. And then there's the rest of us who may say that we believe in climate, but we live in denial. I don't think mostly we have to change people's minds. I think that un unfortunately climate impacts are going to do that on their own. What we do have to offer people is the hope that something better is possible than what we have now. Because if folks don't feel there's an alternative way of living and being, if there's no hope for tomorrow, then why don't I just go down with what we got now? And so my challenge to you as the climate movement here in Concord, and my challenge really to a climate movement on a whole, is that it is time that we begin to create a vision for a new way of living that makes room for unemployed coal workers and school systems that bring the same quality of education to Charlestown High in Boston as Concord Carlisle. Systems that will allow young people to imagine the solutions to our problem. Too long our movement has believed that climate is the only issue and the most important issue. 
And by functioning that way, we have lost the opportunity to be in solidarity with people who feel other pressing issues in their lives. Well, now we see pretty clearly <laughs> that if we don't work with people and across issues, we will see the little bit of progress we've seen stripped away as we see a populist wave that has brought in an administration that doesn't even believe climate change is real. I'm sure like me, when you turn on the news, you feel that bit of angst and you have that crisis. But my invitation to you tonight is to lean into this crisis, not as something that has to unhinge us, but something that creates amazing opportunities to dialogue, to create new solutions, and to reimagine a world that not only addresses climate, but all the other ills that we've seen grow in this moment. Part of my job is just to make you believe that is possible and then to get excited as you take the success you've had of this kind of forum and build it out in tangible ways that will lead our country and lead our world into a new way of being. Thank you. <laughs>